Hello, and uh, welcome to the science uh, teaser session. Um, an interactive experience. Maybe not too interactive. A um, bit weird, normally I'd have you in the classroom, uh, but we'll see how we go. Hopefully this will, uh, this will make some sense. And you can of course use the live chat thing that we've got going on um, in order to ask any questions as, as the video plays. So, um, this is me, Matthew Rowe, uh, Computer Science Lecturer at East Norfolk Sixth Form. Um, I've been around, um, I've uh, previously worked at the University of Suffolk um, in the Computing Department. Um, also worked at a place called Flegg High, I don't know if any of you are from there, that was a few years ago now. Um, been a Computing Lecturer at Redbridge College and also Newman College in East London, um, the network management consultant for various global telecommunications companies, Viag and Cellnet, uh, O2 and um, uh, Colt Telecom, places like that, and uh, I've been a programmer in the uh, City of London as well. And um, now I'm here, and hopefully you'll benefit from some of that experience. So, this is what we'll be covering. Uh, two year course, uh, you end up with a, an A level in computer science. Um, in year one, you get a sort of mini version of what comes up in year two. So you get um, two papers. The first one's on computing principles, and that covers processors and operating systems and program. Programming's a big thing, programming comes up in everything. Uh, you look at databases, website design, uh, and laws. And in paper two, Lots more programming in there. We've got some algorithms that you need to learn there, bubble sort and things like that. And uh, we'll look at some programming techniques and we'll look at um, some of the, the underlying principles of programming. But essentially what you'll be given is a few problems and you'll need to write code and pseudocode that solves them, those problems. And um, year two is sort of similar, but the papers now are two hours and 30 minutes long twice the length of the ones you get in year one. Um, paper one covers similar stuff in a bit more depth, and paper two covers similar stuff in a bit more depth. And then you've got a project as well, and the project uh, makes up 20% of your overall grade. So it's quite a big thing, and we do spend quite a lot of time on that. Um, and you'll spend some time learning uh, programming, which will feed into paper two as well. So the, the things you do in the project help you in paper two. Alright, so again, use the online chat thing if, you, uh, if you've got any questions about that. And if you've missed the live version, call it live, uh, then by all means email me. Um, I'll write down an email address uh, now. Let's do that now. So it's um, M row at East Norfolk dot AC dot UK. So if you've got any uh, questions and you have missed the, the online chat thing, then uh, do feel free to uh, contact me on that. Okay, so let's get on to computing. We'll talk to you a little bit about computing and why computer science is so important. Computers are everywhere now. It's, it's ubiquitous, uh, if you're familiar with that word. It means that they're, uh, they're found in all sorts of places. A chap called uh, Mark Weiser in 1991, um, in a magazine called Scientific American, um, he discussed the world we experience today. Um, uh, in 1991 he was talking, he was saying that, that, that we're heading towards ubiquitous computing, we're heading towards um, uh, computers in everything. And he said there were three phases. So uh, phase one was shared computing. That's basically the way things used to be in the 60s and 70s. Um, so what you, you had, you had a big building full of people working on computers. And all of those computers weren't really computers, they were called dumb terminals. And they communicated via a wire to a mainframe computer, and that was a great big computer, filled up a whole room, and um, 
that provided the computing power for all the people in the offices. Mainframes were ridiculously expensive, um, ridiculously complex to run, and um, weren't very powerful compared to what we've got nowadays. Uh, then Weiser talked about phase two, which was one machine, one person, which is pretty much the scenario you've recognised for at least the last 20 years. So everyone sits in front of their own computer, the computer does the work itself, generally, um, and you've got access to all the power at your fingertips. And then phase three, which was quite advanced in 1991, was uh, when computers begin to disappear. Um, so you are using computers, but you don't realise you're using computers. So um, you work through a computer rather than with the computer. So if you're driving, um, you've basically got a great big machine, it does all sorts of things, it can indicate for you, it can do everything else. You don't really think of it in those terms. You think of the car as an extension of yourself. You know, you, Once you get used to it, you can drive it, you can turn left, you can go right. You go up a hill, you go down a hill. You don't really think about what's going on. It just works. So, question for you is: Are we are we there? Yet? Have we got computers to work without us realising computers are working? Now, do we do we understand that we're using a computer, um, uh, or do we just talk and, and expect things to happen? And um, uh, we don't actually think about the fact that there's a computer working in the background. Difficult using a video to, to know how much uh, time to give you on this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump through to the next slide. But if you want to pause the video at all, do feel free. Um, but here's some examples where you might use a computer without realising you're using a computer. So we've got the Fitbit. That thing that goes on your wrist, that's actually a computer, it's got its own operating system and that's uh, doing all sorts of things, it's tracking your heart rate, it's tracking your, uh, your exertion, the number of steps you do, etc, where you are in the world. Um, so there's a computer working there and you might not realise it. Your Amazon Echo or Google Home System, you say Alexa, can you set me a reminder for two minutes? Hopefully you're not putting this on too loud near your Alexa. Um, Again, computer working behind the scenes there. There is a bit of computing power in the Alexa and there's also computing power that Alexa can tap into. Self-driving cars, not quite there yet. My sister-in-law is involved in the uh, legal side of self-driving cars and she's explained there are a number of different levels of self-driving car. The one that I want is the, 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 the ultimate level, I think it's level seven, um, whereby there's no steering wheel. You just get in. You tell the car where you want to go, uh, I want to go to McDonald's, and it'll take you there. And you don't need to think, you, you can do whatever you like. You can sit and stare out the window and just enjoy the ride. That's where I want. And there are others that sort of basically drive for you, but you have to be ready to take over in an emergency. I don't like the sound of that. Um, you've got some coffee machines. So smart locks are uh, locks that can read your fingerprint. They're computer powered. Some coffee machines. Um, work with computers inside them. Fridges, tell you how many ingredients you've got. You can tap into some fridges and say, have I got the ingredients for uh, chicken curry, for example. And the fridge will be able to tell you, because the fridge will know what's there. It can also order stuff for you as well. This is the Internet of Things, a big thing that Samsung are doing. So Samsung are uh, not developing phones in the way they used to. They're really concentrating more on the Internet of Things. They see that as the future. Went to Tallinn um, last Christmas. Don't know if we'll be allowed to go this Christmas thanks to all this uh, COVID thing. But um, if we can, I'll, yeah, we will. But it might be the year after when you're in year two. But uh, they talk about the internet of things in the airport. So when they're doing the airport tours, they're looking at trying to put internet technology into the road services, internet technology into the... Um, uh, into the uh, CCTV um, so that everything can communicate with everything else and if there are crowds building up in one area we can instruct the opening of a different corridor that sort of thing. Um, so uh, lots and lots of uh, ways in which we can use computers without realising we're using them and that's where you come in because all these computers 
need to be programmed and need to be controlled and need to be um, developed by people like yourselves. A lot of money in that. Okay, so let's try and explain MP3s and the way they work uh, and MP3 compression through the magic of computer science. So um, I took this off the internet, uh, Peter McCarry and Paul Curzon of Queen Mary University, and um, you may have come across this before, but hopefully not in MP3 compression technology. So here we go. So I'm going to read your minds, even though you're not here in the room, I'm going to read your minds. Um, I want you to pick a card, I want you to memorise the card, and I want you to, uh, I'll ask you something about your card in, in just a minute. Okay. So we've got a um, number of cards here on the board. Hopefully you can read them. I would like you to zoom in on one and choose it. Zoom in on one and choose it. Have a think about that for a minute. Got it? Okay. My computer, with its amazing power, has removed your card. See if you can find it. Bet you can't. I've got a feeling some of you might be shouting at your screens at the moment saying, this is, this is how that works, there's nothing magical about this. Maybe not, maybe not. Um, I'm, I'm assuming one of you uh, can get it. It's called the Princess Card Trick. And uh, this is how it works. So we've got the, um, the this seven of spades, eight of diamonds, nine of hearts, etc. And we've got slightly different cards here. They're all fairly boring cards. There's no ace of hearts in there or anything. There's no uh, queen of hearts. There's, there's nothing particularly interesting, no king of diamonds. So all the cards are quite bland. And by picking one, you're just concentrating on that one thing. You're not concentrating on all the rest. And then you're looking for that one thing and it's gone. And that's how MP3 compression works. Um, so, if you were to record every single noise in a, an orchestra, you listen to an orchestra, you've got the trumpets playing, you've got the flutes going, you've got um, the, the man playing the triangle in the corner, um, glockenspiels and all the rest of it, I can't think of any more instruments, but anyway, they're all going. There's an awful lot of noise there. And if you try and record all of that noise and stick it into an MP3, your MP3 is going to be massive. There's so much data there. So, um, how do we overcome it? And, and, and where does the princess card trick come into it? So, um, what our brains do, they will concentrate on what they think is important. So what, what's important? What's, what's the most important thing that you, as a user, need to know about? And our brains will sort that out for us. So, when we hear a big drum, boom, we hear the big drum. It's important. It's, clearly very loud, it's very important. And all these other sounds, all these lesser sounds in the background, we don't hear them. We, we, we don't hear them, we're, we, we're unaware of what's going on. Just while I'm talking, I'm just going to walk around the back of this camera and make sure we are recording. Yes, we are. I won't have to do this again. <laughs> so. Um, what we do, we concentrate on what's important to us. In the same way that before, we concentrated on, on the card that we've, we were interested in, and we didn't really look at all the others, we didn't memorise all the others. Um, so you'll concentrate on this big, big drum, and you won't hear all the other sounds. So what we can do, these are called masked sounds. They're masked, they're, they're hidden from us, and they're hidden because we've got this big, loud, important sound in the middle. Therefore, we can get rid of them. We get rid of them, take them away out of our MP3, which reduces the amount of data we need to store. Um, it's exactly the same thing uh, as, as we did with the cards, but this time on your ears. And it's called psychoacoustic encoding. And this sort of thing comes up quite regularly throughout the course, this, uh, this type of um, method of looking at the way the human brain works and then trying to use that in order to save data. So um, we can do that, we can save that data and we can reduce the amount of size that our MP3s take. Very clever. 
got any questions, stick them into that, that chat thing for the building environment. Um, the other thing that computers need to do now is um, we need to pick out the important parts. So the, what are the important parts? If, we, if we're going to record an MP3, how do we know which are the important parts? Well, in this, this example, it's the louder parts, but um, there'll be other parts of the music where that changes. It's not always the loudest noise that we save in the MP3, because that might sound a bit weird. But they're, they're important parts. And these, these things are called salient markers. So this picture here of, of a road, um, we can look at this as humans and we can see there's some some evergreen shrubbery maybe there we've got a nice grass verge which seems to be quite well maintained we've got a road going around the corner there to the right um, we've got some sort of hot air balloon up there the computer doesn't care about all that the computer wants to know if it's guiding a self-driving car guiding it safely so what we can do we can apply salient filtering to it which will give us this picture now this picture is not as nice to us but to a computer, it, it's much, much better. We've got the curve of the road, and we've got this sign here. Now, this sign's important, as it would be if you were driving. So, apply a salient filter over the top of it, and that enables the computer to much better pick out the things that are important. So, it, it sees the things that are important, and it's able then to, to guide the car in a better way. So, Saliency helps us decide what's important. What I'm going to do, I'm going to show you an image in a second. And the image changes. It shows you one image and then a second image. I'm going to show you two. I'm going to show you uh, the first one. And hopefully that's fairly easy for you. And you'll be able to point out what, the, the change. Um, in this case, the change, because it's driving, would be this would become closer and this would become closer and we need to adjust the wheel, etc. So spotting changes in... in this salient information is important. So I'm going to show you the first one, and hopefully you'll be able to point out, pick out what changes. So here's our image, second image, first image, second image. Give a second to look at that. Might be quite difficult on the video camera there uh, to actually see what's happening. But um, what we've got here, we've got this chap on a motorbike, we've got this sign at the front, and uh, because the sign is you know, quite obviously changing, um, and it, it's, it's, it's obvious, this is an important part. So our salient filtering that we do as humans, we, we look at that as being an important part of the image. And, uh, there we are, There's the, the mileage is changing, the mileage is there and it's not there in the second image. Show you a slightly harder one now. This is a seaport. Seaport. I'm going to zoom the camera in just a little, give you some sort of chance of seeing it. So zoom in a bit on that. Hopefully, hopefully you can see that now. Hopefully, I haven't cut too much out of it. As your your mind would be working now, and you've got a seaport, there's a boat coming in, boats where things are likely to the sea areas where things are likely to be happy, probably concentrating on that. Um, what you're probably not looking at is this part here. You see that? Windows, no windows. Uh, windows, no windows. And the reason why you probably didn't spot that is because you're not really concentrating on that. You don't really care about it. You're looking at the things that you think are important. Now, we could, of course, program a computer to look at the buildings, etc. Let's say we're trying to spot some sort of terrorist activity. We could train a computer to do that. But as humans, we don't really care about that. So what do you think? What do you think? Um, how could we that benefit us as computer scientists?
Well, it can benefit us because we know that most humans will stare at this. If they're looking at this image, they're going to stare at that. We know they're not really going to stare at this, this part of the image, because it's not particularly important. It's not the, it's not the thing that is of most interest. So we can reduce the amount of detail that we put in this area. We can reduce the amount of detail we put in that area, and therefore save ourselves some space. Save ourselves some space from the old image there. So it's a, it's a very, very good way to reduce the space and save ourselves bandwidth. And, uh, two of the most critical things in computing at the minute are um, getting enough data over the, over the network and making sure it's safe, encrypting it properly. I'm not going to go into that today, but they're two of the most important things. And if we can save space, we can save bandwidth. We can do it without a negative impact. I, we don't want the human to realise that there's all this space, all this detail has been stolen from them. So we want them to have the same experience, but we don't want to spend money on the bandwidth, so we want to reduce that wherever we can. So, um, computer science, all about looking into things like this, and all about trying to, uh, trying to reduce uh, what we give the, the user, but without the, um, without affecting their enjoyment, without affecting their overall experience. Okay, uh, let's have a bit more, a bit more magic. I'll show you how to con people. Um, so magic squares. Actually, this isn't the conning part. The conning part's going up in a minute. Magic squares. So um, hopefully you know what these are. If I, if I bring up this, the magic square. Let's say a three by three square. So. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine possible places where we can put a value. And the idea is that you need to put values in so that everything in this direction adds up to the same number as everything in this direction and the same number in, in this direction as well. So everything needs to add up to the same. Now, the way these work, uh, they're, they're done on uh, factorial. Uh, so uh, number of possible combinations. So there's uh, nine possible values we can put into this one, times nine possible values we can put into this one, times nine possible values we can put into that one. Um, oh, sorry, times eight that we can put into that one. Uh, yeah. So basically, the, 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 the mathematical way of writing it is nine factorial. Nine factorial possible combinations. Just quickly bring that up. In, on the screen for you. I'm going to drag this across here. Nine factorial. So the three by three square, there are 362,888 possible, um, possible combinations for a three by three magic square. So if I were to ask you to write a four square magic number, which adds up to a particular given value, which has got about half a billion possible combinations, you'd probably think it's impossible. It's, it's not, it's, there's, there's no way of doing it. And then if I were to give you some rules, some computer science rules, you find actually it is possible, and not only is it possible, it's quite easy. So, here is um, a lookup table. This is a, a thing that we can use in computer science. And um, the way it works is you take a value, n. So I'm going to say my value is 23. And I want 23 to be the number this way, 23 to be the, the sum this way. 23 to be the sum that way, that way, that way, and that way. So I want 23 to be my n. You can pick a different number. You can pick a different number. You can pick, um, 
15, you can pick 30, whatever you want. But the way you do it is you create this square, this grid, and um, you could do this using a pen, I would suggest you do. Um, and you create the square, you create the grid, and you take n minus 20. Well, n is 23, 23 minus 20 um, would give you 3. So you write the number 3 in there. And then 1 stays the same, 12 stays the same, 7 stays the same, 11 stays the same, 8 stays the same. n minus 21, 23 minus 21 um, is uh, 2. And then you work out all the others, and then you add them up. And what you should find is that everything equates to that number. So, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to zoom in on this so that you can see it properly. I'm going to ask you to pause the video here and uh, see if you can work it out. See if you can do your own magic square for any given number. Okay, so if you pause the video there. Okay, I'm going to assume you've managed to do that by now. Assume you've managed to do that by now. Hopefully. So, half a billion, give or take, possible combinations for a 4x4 four four magic square, and you've been able to do it in five minutes. Absolutely incredible, isn't it? And it's just by using logic and by using... Um, uh, pragmatic thinking, practical thinking, straightforward thinking, that we can uh, come up with these rules and come up with these inventions and uh, make the seemingly impossible possible. It's quite fun. So um, the lookup table uses algebraic representation, which can be easily programmed in any programming language. But if you do Python at school, fantastic you'll be able to do that. But don't do Python at school. Don't worry about it, we do C-sharp here anyway, and um, I would recommend you have a look at C-sharp before you come, but it will mean all the Python programmers have got as much to learn as the people who have never programmed before. Um, unless, of course, you're very motivated and you do it through the summer holidays, which I would recommend. Or now, you don't do anything now, are you? Finish school. So, uh, yeah, get some apps on your phone, C-sharp apps. Um, and uh, learn what you can. Also Unity as well. Unity is a good thing. Download that, get yourself a free course off Udemy and see how you get on with that. So um, once we do something like this, we need to establish a correctness proof. So once you've established the rules, let's move that down, uh, you can apply them against many different inputs to prove your theory. So I took 23, you may have taken 36, whatever. Um, and you can just keep going around and prove that that works. I can tell you it does, but you don't want to take my word for it. Try it with a few different numbers. So what have we learned so far? Well, computer scientists can use psychology to make machines uh, which are more perceptive or aware of ourselves than we are. Um, there are some interesting cases about that. Well, we'll go on to that when we cover ethics when you're, you're here in the room. Computer scientists can create, uh, use creative patterns to make difficult tasks easy, such as the magic square. And we are amazing people. Uh, definitely amazing people. Okay, um, one more game. One more game. Now, this is quite good. This one you can play against your parents or your friends or whoever. Uh, this is a, a left to right number game. Okay. So I haven't done this before in front of people. Um, but basically we need a line of 2n integer cards. So 2n is just a fancy mathematical way of saying an even number of cards. So you might have 5, which is one number, that's not 2n. 3, that's now 2n. Um, 4, not 2n. 8, 2n. Just an even number. Is it divisible by 2? 12, 4, 6. So that's a, that's a 2 n list. Yeah, it's even numbers. Yeah? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So what we do, we, we get a line of, of cards 
And um, what you'll say, and this is important, you'll say I'll go first. So five, four, three, two, and you say I'll go first, and you pick a card. Take that one. And then the opponent says, okay, well I'll go now, I've got a choice between four and two, um, I'm going to go for four because that's bigger. Yeah? And then you say, well, okay, I'm going to go now. I've got to choose between three and two. I'm going to go for three because that's bigger. And um, then your opponent has only got one to choose from, so they go for that. And then you add up what you've got, in this case, six versus um, eight. And you, as the red player, won, won that particular one. I'm going to show you uh, how you can not only win, but also you can predict how much you win by, which is uh, quite impressive. And using computer science, of course. Um, so here are the rules, which I've already gone through. Each player on their turn takes a card from uh, one of the line ends, either left or right. And the winner is the player whose sum of n cards is larger. And uh, I'll guarantee you never get a higher total than me, or in this case, you can guarantee that nobody get a higher total than you. Um, and you can also predict how much you'll win by. Okay, so normally this is interactive. So normally I say, I'll call out a number. Well, I like that, but I can't do that because you're at home. Okay, so um, I'll write down the numbers we need, and then we'll end up with a line of numbers. So let's assume we've done that. We've got two, four, three, one, eight, five, four, three. And on your first go, you can choose two or three. And on your second go, or the, the, then the next play, let's say the first person chooses two, that goes. On the next go, the second person's got a choice between four and three. Let's say they choose four, yeah, etc. You, you get the idea. I've been through that once, so I won't go through it again. And the idea is to get the highest. Okay, so how are we going to work this out? How are we going to work out the end product of this game? We could use a greedy heuristic. Now, what a greedy heuristic is, a heuristic uh, approach is a common sense approach. So the greedy heuristic would say, well, I'm going to take the larger of the ends. So given the choice between five and three, I'm going to go for five, that's the larger, and I'm going to go for that. Um, but if you, if you have a look, if you take the five, that's going to give the next player a choice between the nine and the three, and the nine is the key card, that's what you want. So, is that the right thing to do? Is, is a greedy heuristic the, the right move? Okay, so maybe we could look at the delta. And what a delta is, it's a spread. It's um, uh, a spread of, of cards in this case. So I'm going to look at deltas. I'm going to say, well, 5 plus 9, that gives me 14. 3 plus 3 gives, gives me 6. So, what should, I, what should I go for there? What should I go for there? Still the danger of falling into a trap. Because if you say, well, I'm going to go for this delta, you're still freeing up the nine. But if you go for this one, then the next user's still got the ability to not free up the nine for you in the next round. So maybe greedy heuristics aren't the way to go. There's an extreme heuristic. So what we can do, we can identify the locations of the larger cards and try and get these. So there's a 9 there, there's a 9 there, and there's an 8 there. I'm going to go for those. They're the ones I'm going to go for. Um, how am I going to get them? Well, I'm not going to pick that 5 because that will free it up. I'm going to go for the 3 first. And then the next player is going to go for the 5, hopefully, because that's bigger. And then that frees me up for the 9. But if the next player is thinking in the same way as you, then you... you you're stuffed. You can't, you're not going to get to it. Or one of you will get to it by default. But there's no real guarantee of it. Um, it's, it's tricky. It is tricky. So another way we could do it is we could use a deterministic approach. Now this is extremely costly in terms of computer power. What it means is that you program every single possible move. A bit like what you might do in a chess game if you're, you know, if you're running a really big chess game. Um, you might try and go through every single possible move for every single player. But what you find is that even on a short game like this, you run out of space. 
because it's very, very costly. Um, it's definitely not easy, and it'll mean that you're, you're, you're storing all these possible moves, and possibly there's never any point for it. So what do we need to do? Any idea? We need to look for patterns. Okay, so this is divergent thinking, creative thinking. Um, the game involves a selection from alternate locations. So maybe look at the movement and not on the values. So ignore the values for the time being. So if we have a look at these, this is a odd value, even value, odd value, even value, odd value, even value. Uh, the leftmost card is initially in an odd location, one, and the rightmost card is in an even location. Okay. The leftmost card is removed, so we remove this. And then we've got uh, two even locations. The, the, the next player can only choose an even card. Ah, so what if I choose that? And that gives me the choice, remember I'm player one, of an even or an odd. So I can, I can go for odd again, which gives them just the choice of evens again. Oh, this is something we might be able to play with, hopefully. So, knowing that, knowing that I can pick, so if I go for, say, I, I want odds, oh sorry, I want evens, I'm going to pick the even first, which gives the choice of the next player of two odds. Um, they can go for whatever odd they like, they can go for that one. But then I want to make sure that they're stuck with odds again, so I go for that one. And then I want to make sure that they're, whatever one they choose, they go for that, I want to make sure that they continue. So what I'm doing here is I'm continually just copying what they do to make sure that every time they choose a card, they're always taking an even. So I'll go for that again, and he goes for that. Okay, well I want to make sure that they, they, they have to go for evens all the time, so I'm going to eliminate that one. And I can force them to choose a side. I can force them either to be evens or odds. And by knowing that, I can then win the game. So, if I add up all the even locations, that's 32. And if I add up all the odd locations, that's 33. 33 is the bigger number, and it's one higher than the evens. So I can say with confidence, if you let me go first, I will win, I will win by one point, and you will get 32. I can say that. And then what I'll do is I will just pick the odd locations. Now remember, odd is here, so I'll go for that, which gives the other player a choice of two evens, even and even. Uh, and then whatever they do after that, I just copy. So if I go for that, well, I'll, 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 I'll stay on this side, I'll, I'll go on that side. And then they've only got a choice between a green and a green. So if I go for that side, I'll then go for that. Which gives them a choice between a green and a green. And it forces them to stay on the evens. Sorry, on the... Yeah, on the evens. And in the end, once we add up all these cards, I'll have one. Make sense? Probably easier if we... Uh, if we try it. Let's have a look. I'll run through an example and then hopefully what you'll be able to do is go downstairs and bet your dad five up that you can beat him in this game. So here's a list of numbers, the ones that we gave earlier. And uh, here's the odds and the evens all laid out. So odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. What I do with this is I'll add up all of the odds. I'll add the two, the three, the eight, and the four, and that'll give me a total of 17. Then I'll add up the evens. Well, I've got four, I've got one, I've got five, and I've got three, and that adds up to 13. So I know that if I pick odds, I will win by four points. Yeah? Brilliant. Okay, so now let's play the game. So my side, I choose the odd side, because I know the odd side's a winning side. Um, so the two's gone. The opponent has got a choice between an even and an even, a four and a three. Uh, doesn't matter because they can only choose an even, but I must copy what they do after that. 
So the opponent choice was four, which is now gone, which means I have to pick this side because I don't want them to have a choice between odd and even. I want it to have a choice between even and even. So I pick that side, and it's a three, and now I've only got a choice between even and even. Only choice is three, didn't really matter, it could have gone for either side, it wouldn't have made any difference. But I need to make sure that I copy that side, go for the same side. Okay, so I've copied that side, that's gone. Again, they've only got a choice between even positions and even positions. So uh, they, they choose the five, because it's larger. So that goes. Then obviously I choose the eight, because it's on the same side. And that goes, and that leaves them with a one. And if we add up what they got, my total two plus three plus four plus eight equals 17, as predicted. Their total four plus three plus five plus one uh, equals 13, as predicted. So not only did I win, but I also figured out what score they'd get before we even started. That's a seemingly impossible task. If you go right back to the start of this and think, well, how are we going to do this? Seemingly impossible. But using computer science and a bit of logical thinking, messing about, playing around with a few ideas, we can get to a, an algorithm which makes sense. And it's an algorithm which is really easy to follow. Good plan? Hope you like it. Okay, so uh, greeny algorithms, you have to be careful with them. They're not always the best way to go. Sometimes they are, but they're not always the best way. Uh, dynamic programming means breaking the problem down. Um, can result in lots and lots of work. So if we try and assess every single possible move, it's, it's virtually impossible. Um, values versus locations, that's the addresses of numbers, that was a good way of, of thinking about it. And divergent thinking, another fancy word, it means the importance of creativity. So I've got some creative minds amongst you. This might be the choice for you. Okay, so we can't do things with a partner, I should have changed the text, I do apologise. Um, but basically what this is saying is this is saying go and try it. I'd suggest you do. Why not? Why not go downstairs now, get your mum, your dad or your sister or brother or somebody else in the house to write a list of numbers, make sure there's an even number of numbers, or maybe 10 numbers, quickly take the paper away, do your maths, and uh, then tell them how much you'll beat them by, and by how much. And then play the game, make sure it works for you. That's, uh, what do we call that? Testing? Uh, proof testing, something like that, wasn't it? Let's talk about money. Let's talk about money. If you want to pause the video at this point and run downstairs and do it, then do feel free. Come back now. Yeah? Talk about money. Uh, richest people in the world, according to Forbes 2017, it may have changed very slightly now, but not by much. Bill Gates, Microsoft uh, manager, uh, owner, founder, um, now doesn't do a great deal, uh, Jeremy gives his money away. Warren Buffett, uh, stocks and shares, trader, dealer. Jeff Bezos, we've heard of him, haven't we? Amazon. Um, Amancio Ortega from Spain. You have to look him up. I'm not too familiar with him. And Mark Zuckerberg, uh, obviously, you know him, Facebook fame. So, richest people in the world. Which of them made their money from computing? Bill Gates, obviously, Jeff Bezos, and Mark Zuckerberg. Um, which is, where's my, where's my, uh, which is uh, three-fifths of the richest people on earth. I would also argue Warren Buffett uses a, an awful lot of computing power, um, something called linear regression to uh, plot stocks and shares. And linear regression is something I'd quite like to get into on your project. I've got a few learners working on it this year, but I want to expand that. So Warren Buffett uses computing power a lot as well. So you could probably argue that's four-fifths of the richest people on earth. Could be you. Hopefully it is. A uh, little point of people worry about the mathematical content. Um, there is a misconception that without strong mathematical skills you will not pass computer science at A-level. And there is also at this college um, a requirement for you to have very good maths grades. That's to prove you can think logically. It's a 
prove you can use algorithms, it's to prove that you've got the intelligence to pass what is quite a tricky course unless you're motivated. But I would say maths is useful, but it's not vital. So if your math skills are, are teaching, but you've got other skills, and you've got a GCSE in computer science, or you've got a, some good science backgrounds, physics, that type of thing, um, do give it a go. Um, as long as you're creative, you can find your way to a solution. That's, that's really what we're after. Um, and obviously, being good at maths is great, but the computer is, after all, a massive calculator. So uh, it's, it's the, the ability to do maths in your head isn't required. The ability to think from one place to another is far more important. Um, back to money again. Back to money. The UK needs over half a million additional workers in the digital sector by 2022. It's far away. Uh, Java developer, if you choose to develop in Java, which is like a, uh, an Android based uh, programming language, 57,500. Actually, you can use Java and Apple as well. Uh, the average salary for a data scientist, that's something you can look at for patterns in data, something I could ramble on about for ages, um, 45,000. These are averages, not, not maximums. Um, the average salary for a database manager, 60,000. That's a very easy job as well. Um, so computer science opportunities are global, and you can work anywhere. You can work in uh, Australia, you can work in America, you can work in um, you know, Mexico, wherever you choose, you'll find opportunities for uh, um, computer science. Okay, so it pays the bills, but let's say you're an artist, creative type. Computer science is an excellent field in which to stretch your creativity. You can design and print 3D artifacts, you can make things out of 3D printers. They're even doing entire ceilings now, 3D printed. Houses, have you seen the 3D house printing on YouTube? Worth a look. But ceilings are, are incredible. Um, what they are, they're very ornate ceilings, and they're very light. So what you do, you use all the strength of your, your, your core um, material and you make it look really nice. And then what you end up with is a very light piece of material that you can sort of lift up with one arm. Actually, it's stronger than traditional stuff as well. Um, you can invent slick coding solutions in your own style. You know, creative thinking is, is one of the key things. And it's... Um, a very expressive uh, science. This exp you can express yourself in it in a lot of different ways. You can you can come up with your own solutions for things. And uh, as long as you've got that creative mindset, you can come from any background at all. Okay, I'm going to give you a brief video, and then I'll stop talking. I'm not quite sure how long I'll be going on for, but I'm sure it's longer than you're happy with. Um, I've given you a few computer science heuristics, which. Uh, way of learning. Um, there's a university project by a student called Zabir at Queen Mary University uh, that uh, required, where Zabir created an emotional robot. And I quite like this, I quite like it. You have to look out for the smart, it's not, not going to be straight away. So this program, uh, robot was not programmed, all of its behaviour was learned by the developer spending hours and hours teaching appropriate responses. Machine learning is quite an interesting thing. Uh, basically, the machine will copy what you do, and then you tell if it's right or wrong, and eventually it gets things right. So, um, I'll show you how that looks. Now, you could start, you could do something along those lines. Just to point out, here's the, the mouth of the robot. So, uh, hopefully you can see that all right. I'm going to pause that for a second because it's not loud enough. There we go. Let's try that. Hey, you want to do robot? You can be a silly robot at times, can't you? You silly robot. That's right. Are you getting sad now? Yeah? But stop doing that. That's right. Silly robot. You stupid robot. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Give me some sleep. Please smoke with me. I'm really sorry. Please. Good robot. Good robot. That's right. Uh, 
Sometimes I just had enough of you. You sit all over. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to surprise you. Surprise. I'm sorry. It's not for you, please. That's good. Good job. That's it. That's a good job. Okay. Get back to bed. And there we go. That's some sort of thing you could do for your project. Okay. You're right, good robot. But you can be a silly robot at times, can't you? So, if you've got any questions, please do put them onto that online chat thing. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully that will work for you. Um, do, do stick them on there and I'll carry on. Um, Self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, basically, I don't know. To go through. I will go through, it's only a minute. I'll go through self-fulfilling prophecies and hopefully that will help you out. It's a long road and it's a painful road, but I'm never going to give up on her. She's my child. Hi, my name is Ted. <laughs> What's up, Realized Nation? Isaac here, checking in in the Realized Cup. And today I want to talk about self-fulfilling prophecies, which is something I think is very important but not... Uh, very well understood by people. Now, back in the day, I used to sit exams, and I would study for these exams, right? Put in the work. But whenever it was time to actually sit the exam, the final exam, I would always crack under pressure for whatever reason. I always crack and just get mind blanks. I forget about everything I studied, I would not manage my time properly and always end up getting shitty results. So my friends were all surprised because I was, was the one teaching them before the exam, but would get the worst marks during or after the exam. So I realized that the reason this kept happening, the reason this pattern kept happening is because of the self-fulfilling prophecy. I started believing that I would mess up in the exam and because I believed it, I kept thinking about it, it actually happened. So, believe you're gonna mess up, and you will. So how can we turn that around? How can we do things in a good way? You've gotta see where you're gonna be in 10 years time. The best thing you could do is think right now, where do you wanna be in 10 years? And if in 10 years time, you wanna be um, working in a leisure center as a gym instructor, nothing wrong with that. You can start to work towards it now. Don't want to waste your time in computer science. If you see yourself in 10 years' time living in New York, you see yourself in 10 years' time uh, working as a, a security advisor to um, MI5, you see yourself in 10 years' time uh, being part of the, the um, uh, Google, working on Google Maps, that sort of thing, then this is the way for you to achieve those dreams. Um, but you need to have those dreams. You need to think about where do I want to be in how we're going to get there. So please do now take the time to think about where you want to be in 10 years because that will really help you choose your subjects. Um, computer science is difficult and it's complex um, and to get an A in it is quite a rare event. But if you see yourself working somewhere you're going to have the motivation to get there. You're going to have the motivation to put the hours in and you're going to have the motivation to achieve the A's. Studying at Russell Group University the big ones are the, the impressive ones. Um, how are you going to do that? By knowing where you want to go. You know where you want to go. You think, well, this is how I'm going to get there. And um, you, you're motivated to get there because of your ambition. So you need some ambition to get through computer science. You need a goal in order to get through it. It can't be just because you quite like computers. You really need a goal where you want to get to, a bit of a drive. And um, you need to believe in yourself. And if you can do all of that, no problem. I look forward to seeing you in September. Okay. You'll be pleased to hear that's the end of my show. Um, hopefully it was okay for you. And uh, like I said, if you've got any questions at all, do, uh, do put them onto that online chat thing or email me using the email address right at the beginning. This is on YouTube, so you can rewind it as and when you see fit. Okay. Good to see you. Um, hope to see you again in September. Bye-bye.